Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Sally Ann is my name, and uh, I am a grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of al Family Groups, and I'm here to recover from the family disease of alcoholism. And that's my primary purpose. So I called this damn your old meetings because the kind of person that I am, I love a bit of history. I love learning about how this fellowship started and how 12 step recovery started. When I was new and I went to my very first meeting, I picked up the first book that was attractive to me and it was Lois Remembers because I, you know, I love a bit of a novel, a lot of a bit of excitement and drama. And I took it home and I read it cover to cover and I saw myself on those pages. I looked for the similarities and I looked for really how Lois's life was now manifesting in my life. And a lot of it was to do with thinking, with the compulsive thinking, with the obsession with an alcoholic. You know, my biggest qualification to be in al or family groups is that I love alcoholics. I love alcoholics. And, you know, once upon a time, that caused me a lot of heartache and devastation. And today I still love alcoholics and it doesn't cause me any of that anymore uh do they irritate me yes occasionally uh is harm involved yeah occasionally but for me because I've taken my primary purpose and I've put it into action in my life not from the beginning I should say none of what I'm going to tell you about my journey I haven't done any of this perfectly because mistakes are the best teacher I'll ever have in recovery. Mistakes are the best teacher I'll ever have. So anything that I say here today, it's my experience. You know, I share my experience, strength and hope. I don't share my opinions. I don't share my ideas. I don't share my thoughts on something. I really work to stick on my experience, strength and hope. And And before I had any of that, before I'd worked the steps and and found closer conscious contact with the God of my understanding, I didn't have any of that. The only thing I had when I walked in the room is a desire to change an alcoholic, hello, and a love of reading. And so I can't talk about my journey in Al-Anon and not talk about Cal, not talk about Conference of Proved Literature and, um, and, and all of the books on recovery, because It's in there that I found the wisdom that I didn't have when I came in the rooms and that I didn't get until I took the action of working the 12 steps of AA as outlined in Tradition 5. So I read Lois Remembers and I looked at the photos of her life and I saw the transformation that her taking the 12 steps of AA and putting them into action in her life had on her. And I thought, heck, I want that. And I didn't speak for ages in a meeting. And I, I understand that that's not who I am today. And I think, you know, often I say, you know, I'm sure you can't imagine that. But for me, that's one of the examples of how I've been transformed. You know, I walked in and I didn't talk and I didn't talk and I didn't talk. And part of why I didn't talk is I was really caught up in being sad. I came in because I was broken and I was suicidal I wasn't eating I wasn't sleeping I basically managed my own life into the gutter and I remember sitting in in my first few meetings and thinking these people are so wise and they're so happy I've got nothing to contribute to that and you know I was right because I didn't have experience strength and hope of recovery this year I had experience of disease And I had experience of being broken and I had experience of obsession. And what I did have though, was I knew the words to the serenity prayer. 
And so I loved it at the end of the meeting. You know, I would just sit there and listen, 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 listen. And slowly over time, my brain, the obsession would just calm, calm, calm right down. And I could hear what was being said. Then at the end of the meeting, everyone stood up and held hands. We held hands. We connected physically. And then we said the prayer. And that's when I could speak. I could say, God, grant me the serenity. And I could feel connected and feel a part of. And that meant so much to me. And I would come back because I liked the feeling in the room. You know, I liked the relief and I liked being around people who were committed to finding solutions to our common problem. You know, I could hear women share and men share about how the disease of alcoholism had affected their lives and how how those effects were manifesting. And, and it's a disease that often comes up in relationships, obviously. So, you know, people would come each week and they would say, this is going on. And then they would share their experience, strength and hope. And they would say, this is the tool I used. And that serenity prayer was the first tool I was able to pick up and use. And it, it's come to mean a lot to me. Circling back to Lois, sharing a little bit about her story is just historical fact. It's in this book, my favorite book, the Eleanor Family Group's classic edition. I love hearing the story of recovery in Lois's voice. And I'm, if you'll humor me, I just want to read a little bit because I don't want to get her story wrong. Ebby visits Bill. Bill wants what Ebby has. Bill gets sober. This is the answer to Lois's dreams and prayers for their entire married life. I mean, man, if I wanted someone I love to change so, so much. So the change that she wanted has happened. And she says, after a while, I began to realize that I was not as happy as I ought to be and that I resented the fact that Bill and I had no life together anymore and that I was left alone. My job, my life's job of sobering up Bill with all its responsibilities, which made me feel so needed, had suddenly vanished. And I had not found anything yet to fill the void. I did not fully understand what was going on within myself until one Sunday, Bill asked me if I was ready to go to a meeting with him. To my own surprise, as well as his, I burst forth with, darn your old meeting, and I threw a shoe as hard as I could. Now, this is where I insert myself into that story, because I don't know if you've ever been angry enough to throw a shoe, but I sure have. I haven't thrown a shoe, but that rage... I felt that, you know, I've connected to that. And there have been times in my life where I've behaved in ways that I'm not proud of. And I'm so grateful that this wife of an alcoholic got so rageful and so angry that she said a bad word because she didn't say damn, did she? She said damn. And mm-hmm. what's great about this book is it actually has a correction and it says in a later revision, Lois wrote damn your old meetings because damn well, is a swear word in the 1930s. Of course it is. So she didn't want to have to say damn from the podium or write damn in a book. But what I love about this program is it teaches us rigorous honesty So she got to a stage, obviously, where she was like, oh, I'm uncomfortable with that and corrected it. And I think when we think about when I think about or reflect on the gifts that Lois has given me. One of them is when when she threw that show. But the next one is when she realized she needed help because it was the process of throwing that show and I like to think at Bill's head because, you know, you'd, you'd really want to hit your target. I, I couldn't possibly say if that's true or not, but I know that's, that's where I'd be aiming if it was me. And then she realized that that's not who she wanted to be. And she realized that she was the person now who was active in the family disease of alcoholism. And she reached out for help. And so she realized what she had to do was take those 12 steps, those 12 steps from from God and put them in her life and she did and her example of doing that has created this beautiful fellowship of recovery where when I'm 
wanting to kill myself in 1998 in Wellington, New Zealand, I think, well, I could do that or I could go to Alan or Family Groups and see what that's like. So, you know, Einstein doesn't need to be here for us to know which one I, which path I took, right? It's obvious. And her example of willingness to look at her own behavior and willingness to admit when she was wrong and to see the disease in her and take that magnifying glass off her husband and put it on her own life. That's transformative. And that's when the transformation happens. And so I came along and I didn't speak for a long time because I knew I had nothing to contribute, which was true. And then eventually, I think about six months in, I'd heard y'all talk about a sponsor. And what, did, what backing the truck up a little bit, I had been going to open AA meetings because I was dating someone who was in AA. And I say they were in AA, they were in the rooms of AA and they were not drinking but I look back and I can recognize that they were very dry and, and not very well or not very sober because sobriety takes in physical sobriety and emotional sobriety, and they didn't have that second part. And so I would go to AA meetings with them, and I'm so grateful that AAs carried a wonderful message of hope and help to me. You know, they welcomed me. They told me I could have a cup of tea. I could, you know, sit in their meetings and I loved it. I, I loved the fellowship, the warmth and the care and the love and the smiles and the hugs. It was beautiful. And then every now and then they'd tell me about this little magical fellowship called Eleanor Family Groups where I was welcome. I could go to get help. But you know I didn't need help. You know I was fine. Said exactly like that through gritted teeth. Uh, I was fine. I didn't need it because he was the problem. You understand? And uh, I figured that so long as he was in recovery, then we were home and uh I I realized now I was I was wrong I was very mistaken but I go to Eleanor family groups and I sit around and I feel that relief in the meetings for about six months and then I AA had told me AA had told me and, and Eleanor told me you get someone who has what you want and so I ran around and I asked a bunch of people to be my sponsor and I asked this one woman, she's like, yeah, 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 I'll be a sponsor. And she was older and sweet and kind and really loving. And she just seemed, you know, really nice. And so I was attracted to that. And um, anyway, after a while, she rang, she rang me or I rang her, it doesn't matter. And, um, and said she was way too busy and she couldn't actually sponsor me. So I needed to find someone else. So I went to this thing called a Sunday speaker meeting. And there was this woman sharing. And she had this light and it was not only palpable, but I could see it in her eyes. You know, she just lit up. And when she spoke, I hung on every word and I just wanted what she had. You know, she had this beautiful Elizabeth Arden lipstick pink and um, she dressed really fantastically in these beautiful suits. And, you know, I wanted everything that she had. I wanted her life, I wanted her joy, I wanted her happiness, and I wanted her serenity, and I wanted that light that she had. And so much to my own horror, I asked her over the rubbish bin, because we were both having a cup of tea and taking the tea bag out, it fell out of my mouth, will you be my sponsor? And I immediately regretted it, and I knew it was the dumbest thing I'd ever done. And I wanted to grab the words in the air before they landed in her ears and stuff them back in my mouth and then run away as quickly as I could. Because... Being separate, alone, and different was part of the disease. And I didn't want anyone to see me. And I knew that if I got a sponsor and we worked together, that she would see me. And I didn't want anyone to really see me because I knew I was rubbish. You know, I knew I was nothing. And that, that was a little secret that I, I was carrying. So, of course, she said yes. And we started working the steps. And I need, I need to tell you this part of my step work because I need you to understand how ignorant and arrogant I was when I was new and how I've had to completely change my attitude and humble myself and surrender to the discipline, the spiritual discipline of the steps. This is how arrogant I was. Step one, my sponsor tells me to get a piece of paper and make two columns and call them can change, can't change. No, can control, can't control. And so I sit down, 
the simple exercise can control, can't control. And I think about it for a while and I'm like, I don't think I can, what? I'm not, I don't think I'm controlling, I'm not controlling. I'm 24. I'm not controlling. So I, in my arrogance, change the word control to change. Can change, can't change. Because it's just a little bit softer. You know, I was looking for the softer, easier way. And bless my sponsor, I told her what I'd done and she didn't correct me. Because the beautiful thing, what she taught me in that moment is she taught me to, to meet them where they are. And so she met me where I was and she didn't insist that I conform. She didn't say to me, you've done it wrong. She just said, yeah, cool, we can work with that. And so we did. So I had this little step one and it said, can change, can't change. But I did the work. I, and, and by doing the work, the work was essentially the same. I still had two columns. One was very, very short. And that was what I can change. control. And the other one was a lot longer. You guys, it was chock-a-block. And now I look back at newcomer me with such compassion. And I look back at my sponsor at that time. And I just, I'm so, so grateful because she had this, magical ability you know I understand it now it was you know she was a channel for God she treated me like one of God's children and the compassion and the acceptance that she offered me gave me a really safe place to find who I really was and I look back now at the arrogance and the ignorance and through my example It means that today when I work with others, I'm able to access that compassion and that kindness that my sponsor showed me because I've come to understand that I don't know what I don't know. And if I, so long as in a meeting, I'm following our traditions and our concepts, that's great. But outside of the rooms, If I need to change a word here and there, the beauty of Eleanor Family Groups is that I have the freedom to do that. So when we got to what for me at the time was probably one of my most difficult hurdles, which you you know was the G word. I couldn't even say the G word, you guys. It was the G word because I was raised in a home affected by not only alcoholism, but also the G word. And so I had a a head full of preconceived ideas, which working with a sponsor, one by one, we were able to unpack, uncover, discover, discard. We got rid of all of them until what was left on the paper after the exercise that my sponsor got me to do, which for me is a mind map, love a mind map. And so I did a big mind map. And I remember just having this incredible awareness, thanks to my sponsor and doing the work where as I was writing down old God, new God, because I still, I wrote it, I didn't have to believe it, but I could write it. I saw that the G word that I'd grown up with was going to send me to hell because my parents got divorced when I was 11. I hadn't even lived my life and I was going to hell, you guys. It was pretty scary. But God was also forgiving. And it was in that moment when I saw those dualities of that God that I realized, you know, no wonder I can't connect. And so my sponsor led me through that exercise and and told me that I had this freedom granted to me that I could work and create a God that I could believe in, that I could trust. And she told me to just start practicing that and so I did I just created this God that I could believe in and I started doing what my sponsor told me to do and she got me praying and she got me meditating right off the bat she gave me her form of meditation which I still use not perfectly but to this day which reminds me it starts off that I'm a loved child of God and um, if saying that repeating that over and over again doesn't change your life as well as working the steps and I don't know what will and I'm so grateful that I was able to be present 
And I was able to just do what she told me to do. From that first exercise of step one, where I had to control it in a funny way, she just let me go. And she would correct me when I needed it, but she got me through these steps. And then because at the time when I was new in Eleanor Family Groups, I was the manager of a retail store. And in a retail store, you inventory annually. So once I'd finished the steps, I turned to my sponsor and I was like, okay, these have transformed my life. Can we do them again? So from that moment on, I pretty much did my steps annually with my sponsor for about 10 years. And I need you to know too, um, I'm on my fourth sponsor and and it's not through my own will. You know, I, I don't want to change sponsors, but what happened is my first sponsor stopped coming and I can't have a sponsor who's not in the rooms. So I had to get a new sponsor. And that was good for me because my second sponsor was a lot more disciplined and a lot harder and I would never have chose her. And working the steps with her, she got me to start at one, working the steps with her gave me, guess what, an ever deeper understanding of the steps. Because the more I do something, the more I understand it even deeper. So I got to work the steps with her and she was a firecracker. You know, she was super smart and she owned her own home and she lived independently and she had a cat you know she was she was incredible she had lots of things that I wanted and um and serenity to boot and so I just you know I adored her as I adore all my sponsors and then she got a new relationship and she stopped coming and so I hooked up with one of my sisters in recovery so a person who was sponsored by her and we helped each other but only for a short time because I can't co you know like co-sponsoring doesn't work for me then by that time I'd been really active in service and I'd found I'd gone to what used to be called a regional service seminar it's called a team event now and I'd met this woman and she's from another town and she just glowed it was almost like her feet didn't touch the ground when she walked and she's tiny and super old then and and she was funny and she knew the concepts and the traditions inside and out and she was sharp as a whip and had really really firm boundaries and I thought this woman terrifies me I'm going to ask her to be my sponsor eventually you know fast forward a while so I did I asked her to be my sponsor and of course I started working the steps again and this woman was super active in service she had been everything including board chair and international Allen on general services meeting delegate so she'd been to world service you know it's like oh she'd been everywhere and she inspired the heck out of me and to this day you know Renee said she hears my voice in her head occasionally which what a blessing um I can still hear Jillian's voice, you know, and, and she passed away of cancer. I don't know how many years ago, because I've got 99 problems and mass is one of them. But I can still hear Jillian's voice in my head. And one of the kindest things she used to say to me when I would ring her, because I would ring her a lot, because I would get disturbed. Because I, I can be serene when nothing's going on. Like put me in a little bubble with no humans, access to tea, maybe a cat. I'm just going to be serene all the time. It's really easy, you guys. But put me in a room with other humans and I'm going to get disturbed. It's just a matter of time. So I would ring my sponsor when I was disturbed and she would say this line and I still hear it in my head. She would say, oh, are you having a reaction? Or, oh, look, you're having a reaction. And I love that because it was super compassionate, but it also brought the focus back to me. Because the thing is happening with or without me. The thing is going down whether I'm in the room or not. What's going on for me is I'm having a reaction. What am I going to do with that reaction? If I'm disturbed today, what am I going to do with it? And it's it's easy to say but hard to do. If I'm onto it, I'm going to, A, I'm going to notice it. I'm going to be aware of it, right? I'm going to see that I'm having a reaction. And my first sponsor taught me that reaction is the short form of reinaction. Reaction is the short form of reinaction. So my first sponsor taught me that often when I'm reacting to something, what I'm actually reacting to is something in my past that isn't healed yet. And there's this incredible tool called the 12 steps. And when I work through those 12 steps, I can usually find the root problem. I can find the source of the reenactment that's going on. I can find that moment in a child as a child where 
you know, it turns out much to my surprise, I grew up in a home affected by alcoholism. I didn't know this coming into Eleanor family groups. You have to understand, you know, that was something that I uncovered in step work with my sponsors. When I can see that I'm disturbed and I can pause and I've heard it say by people wiser than me that you get a one second pause for every year of recovery. So hello, this is exciting. Uh, I'm It's May, so I'm up to 25 seconds of pause uh, now. It's just new, so bear with me while I get used to that extra second. You know, it's transformative. If I can admit that I'm disturbed and then I can ask for help, And then I learn how to respond. And my first sponsor taught me that responding, the ability to respond is the key for being responsible. So when I'm responsible for me, and I love our Ellen on declaration, there are so many incredible tools in this program hidden right in front of our face. And our declaration talks about when anyone anywhere reaches out for their help, for help let the hand of Ellen on and Alateen always be there. Let it begin with who? Me. And so I always have to look at me. It just, you know, this whole program, I, I came in honestly thinking it was about him and it never was. It was always about me. And it was always about my lack of ability to respond in a kind, compassionate and loving way. So Jillian's example of when she would say to me, oh, you've had a reaction, meant that generally there was some step work to do or that she would give me a reading assignment or that I would have to sit down and and look at where the slip was. And in my early days, often the slip was that I'd gone back to old God thinking. I'd completely forgotten that I had this incredible new power greater than me who could restore me to sanity if I would only ask. You know, so I've learned to ask. I've learned through work with a sponsor and through service, the humility of of asking. And the biggest thing I had to ever ask was to to walk in the rooms. Because when I walk in and sit down, I don't need to speak. I didn't speak for six months. I didn't need to tell you that I was in pain and that I was hurting and that I was here for help. You knew. You knew. Because you were me. And so that help and hope was freely given to me. And my only job today is to continue to deepen my understanding of the steps, the traditions and concepts, and to give that help and hope back to others. So a few years ago, I decided to go to the International Eleanor Convention. And that's a long way for a Kiwi to travel with flightless birds. So it was a lot of plane rides. And, and when you go that far, when I go that far and travel, I like to do little add-ons. So I decided to go to convention and I decided to go to Stepping Stones, which of course, if you're like me and you love the history, and if you're not like me and you don't like the history, have a love affair with the history of this program. It is fascinating. So I went to Stepping Stones and when you arrive, you the house is set up like a museum and you have this little kind of health and safety talk and they tell you what's going to happen. And, and the docent or the guide that we had, he said, he said to us, you know, Lois knew that she was getting towards the end of her life. And so she started preparing stepping stones because it had been set up in a way that they wanted to open the home for us, for the fellowship, right? What a gift. And he said, she's left a gift here for you. And I swear he looked right in my eyes when he said that. And I felt it. And I thought, oh, I wonder what my gift will be. And I also thought, I bet he says that to everyone. And that's just a thing that they say. And it's cute and it's lovely. And who knows? Because I'm a bit of a cynic. Anyway, I walk around Stepping Stones and I, I go into Wits End, Bill's little space where he wrote so many incredible books. And um, I walked around Lois's garden, which is just magical. And I went into the house and and saw their sofa. And I got to look in Lois's closet, you guys. And when I say Lois's closet, you know, I got to find out not only did Lois and I both love alcoholics and both commit ourselves to study of, of the 12 steps of AA, but we both love clothes. So when I say I went into Lois's closet, every single closet in that house is filled with Lois's clothes. Because she loved clothes about as much as I do. So, you know, there's that other connection. Anyway, eventually I went upstairs and I went to her desk. And behind her desk 
is like a filing cabinet. And on that filing cabinet is a letter that she's propped up. Mm. So it's very prominent. It's in a very important place. And I I have to paraphrase this because I'm not allowed to repeat it perfectly because I've asked to have this. And Lois said to a group of people who were starting a 12-step fellowship, she said, I strongly encourage you to present the 12 steps, the 12 traditions, and the 12 concepts of service to newcomers at the very beginning as equally important and complementary to one to each other. And she went on to say, sometimes I see people who know something of the steps fall into the trap of thinking they don't need the traditions and the concepts. You can help your new members to avoid this pitfall by stressing the equal importance of the steps, traditions, and concepts right from the outset. And I was transformed. I knew the minute that I read that, that that's what she left for me. Because that's not how I was raised in Eleanor family groups. That's not how the message was carried to me. The message was carried to me in my first home group was that we work the steps, we read the traditions if we have to. Maybe we'll do one a month. Woo. And um, and maybe occasionally we'll read a concept. Ooh, boring. And uh, and that they didn't really apply to me. And I I would look at them and I'd be like, there's no way those apply to me. I live in New Zealand. I'm never going to the World Service Conference. No. And I dismissed them. Arrogant, maybe? Yeah. And ignorant, maybe? Yes. I can admit that today. And so because I'd been working with this new sponsor and I became more and more active in service, I was forced, I was put in a position where I had the choice to start studying the concepts. And I got to tell you, where I am today, probably how I would talk about the concepts is that they are an accelerant. And for me, when I reflect, and I've been reflecting a lot because I knew I was talking today, I've been reflecting a lot on what's made a difference to me today and what those transformative moments have been. Like, when was my throw a show moment? You know, and when was my spiritual awakening? And, and, and when was my humility moment that really got me to understand the traditions and take them from the wall and put them in my heart? And when did I really understand the concept to a point where I can start to live all of those legacies in my life? And service has been where that's happened for me because I can read something from a book or on the wall, but until I, let me see, experience it, I don't really understand it. So if I'm going to share experience, strength, and hope about concept nine, uh, which is, of course, all about good personal leadership at all service levels is a necessity. I can't do that until I've experienced it. And how do I experience good personal leadership? Generally, I experience bad personal leadership or I demonstrate bad personal leadership. And then I learn what good personal leadership is because I don't know how you are in your recovery, but I tend to go through those extremes of full, hard, core, one end, black, and then the other end, white. You know, that's the ideal. And it's until I remember that there's a power greater than me then I find that happy medium. But if I'm trying to do it on my own, it's black or white. And today, when I think about the steps, particularly, and then the traditions and the concepts, you know, the steps introduce me to a power greater than me. And the traditions introduce me to a fellowship of people. And then the concepts are where I was introduced to myself. And I don't say that lightly. I say that because hidden in the concepts of service are a bunch of words that I used to not be able to pronounce or fully understand that tell me about my life and my behavior. They encourage prudence. I didn't know what prudence was. I thought prudence was like some really sour woman dressed in, I don't know, old prairie clothes who had pursed lips and like clutched her purse really tightly. Like I thought that was prudence. Turns out prudence is, or to be prudent is to make informed plans and choices for the future. I didn't know that. And you know what? I've learned how to make informed, healthy choices for the future by learning through service, what that looks like. And it looks like an ample reserve. What is ample? I don't, like, I, I I grew up in lack. 
you know, I grew up and there's not enough. There's not enough love. There's not enough money. I learned in concept four what harmony looks like. You know, I, I thought harmony was something that people in the orchestra needed. I didn't really have harmony in my life. I had chaos. I knew how to argue. Um, and I knew, you know, I was the kind of Alan Nutt, not working the steps, no, um, not, not using the steps. I was an Alan Nutt who, how I operated was I was the kind of angry, vengeful, toxic um, person who had this facade of niceness, but it was, you know, just a facade. And I, you know, I laugh today. I'm the kind of person who I would put you in a trunk and then I would help people look for you. Yeah. And I learned in harmony that, or, part, you know, participation is key to harmony, that my attitudes had to change. I had to learn how to get along with other people. I had to learn what harmony was and what harmony isn't. Harmony is not raising my voice in a business meeting. Harmony is not gossiping and criticizing about people in service. Harmony is not going to an assembly and then talking smack about it afterwards. Harmony is not after watching someone do service to the best of their ability, just like all those long timers watched me do service poorly, run up to them straight afterwards and criticize them about it. You know, and I learned all of that by, by doing all of that poorly, by doing it wrong and then having it done to me. I'm area chair right now and I chaired an assembly, which is about two hours long and it's a lot of work and a lot of concentrating. And I pray a lot and talk to my service sponsor generally before and generally after. And I said, I use the acronym THINK because there are a lot of people talking, repeating each other and just talking nonsense and so I said be super helpful if before we spoke we could all run what we're thinking of saying through t-h-i-n-k and then I said thoughtful helpful important necessary kind and I was happy with that and of course then the quality of the conversation from the floor of the questions improved of course it did assembly's over I'm putting my books away. I'm still up at the table. I'm just packing up. You know, I'm calming down. We've just said the serenity prayer. A helpful new member comes racing up to me to let me know that I've said think wrong and that the H actually stands for honest. And instead of putting them in a trunk and helping people look for them, I said thank you. Because guess what? They're right. But guess what? I'm right too. And Eleanor's taught me that I can allow someone else the dignity of being right in their own life. I don't know what's right for her. What I know is that she's new in recovery and she needs the reminder of honest because she's not. Because guess what? She is me. When I work or interact with people who are newer than me in the program, the most beautiful thing I can remember is that I am them and they are me. It is like spiritual time travel because once upon a time, I would have done exactly that. And once upon a time, I needed the reminder, to be honest. But today, because I understand on a deeper level that this program requires rigorous honesty and that these steps won't work if I'm not honest, if I don't tell my sponsor the absolute truth, 100% of the time, I'm not going to get well. And if I don't work in service, as Concept 9 says, with good personal leadership, because it's a necessity. It's not a suggestion, you guys. It's a necessity. I will get sick. And when I say I will get sick, I don't mean I'll get a little bit unwell, but I will eventually, for some reason, skip a couple of meetings, and then I will go out and I will die. Because this program has given me my life. And who am I to get in the way of that person and their decision that, that H stands for? honest because I have to be honest all the time I've decided helpful is more important for me and also we were in a service situation so I'm assuming everyone's being honest let's be helpful as well so I think after the pause I've got a 25 second pause to not put you in a trunk and not help people look for you after I've paused because this is the thing, everyone's like, oh, Ellen taught me to pause, yay. But I'm like, but what else? What do I do after that? What next? I can pause now. I tell the truth. 
I ask for help. And then I respond in love. And that one is my, I struggle with all of those on a daily basis, but the respond in love, you know, that's the one I'm spending a lot of time in currently. If I'm current, that's where I struggle. What's helping me with that today is the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Because you guys, when I came in these rooms, I needed you to understand me. And you told me that you did. And this was called Damn Your Own Meetings for a reason. When I reflect on my life and what brought me to the rooms, you know, I came into the rooms because I wanted to kill myself. But I stayed because I saw I was still sick. And one of the ways I saw I was still sick, I was working the steps with my sponsor and I loved my sponsor and she loved me. And, you know, I was the love that I felt in the rooms. It was growing and growing and growing, but I was in this really unhealthy relationship with a dry alcoholic. And one day I was with him and we had an argument and he was not understanding me. And that infuriated me. And so what did I do? I sat on him. He was flat on the floor and I sat on him and pushed him onto the floor. And I'm pretty sure I was probably crying and yelling so that he would understand me. And I'm so ashamed that I did that. That's physical violence. But what happened next was key. A short time after that, we were both vertical again. Like I don't even remember. And we were still going at it, still arguing. And he grabbed me by the shoulders and he shook me. And, you know, I wasn't ready to look at my own behavior because denial is don't even notice I am lying. Didn't even notice. But I noticed his behavior and I knew that that wasn't okay. And I fell to the ground and I was was re-broken. I was as broken as I was the day I walked in. What a gift. And I left it a few days. I went into denial and I left it a few days and I thought, I'm not telling my sponsor about that. And it's for yuck. And then one morning I was getting ready for work and the bruises had started to come up on my arms. And I remember looking at them, clocking them consciously and thinking, oh no, I have to tell my sponsor. And I did. I told my sponsor what had happened. And that was my throw a shoe shoe moment. That was my damn your own meetings, damn your old meetings. That was it. I, you know, I was so focused on the physical violence that he perpetrated that day. I missed my own. And it was until I was ready to get really humble and look at that, you know, look at how ugly I can be. Look at how I'm not trying to find harmony. Look at how I'm not behaving with good personal leadership. Look at how... I'm bringing disease into my interactions because my choice today is there is a God, right? Is there a God? And if there is, is it me? No. When I pray every day to hand my will and my life over to the care of the God as I understand him, and I pray for victory over my difficulties, that victory is not going to come about if I keep secrets. That victory, I'm not going to get well, excuse me. Diva, no. Dog's eating the cat food. Can't have that. I'm not going to get well if I'm keeping secrets. And I'm not going to have victory over my difficulties if I don't look at them honestly. And I think for me, after the pause, this is a, I live in New Zealand. I'm going to wrap up soon. I live in New Zealand. And one of the blessings of living here is our emergency number is 111. So I'm sorry, everyone who lives somewhere else, 111. And I know I've talked about the steps, tradition, concepts, and how important working all of them are so that we don't fall into that trap, right? So the emergency number is 111. So if I'm in an emergency and I need to pause, if I look at step one, what does it say? I need to admit something, right? So that first one is I admit the truth. I admit the truth. That's step one. And then I can zip across to tradition one. And tradition one tells me to unite. So I can remember in that second one, I'm not alone here. 
I can reach out for help and I can find unity because there'll be someone in these rooms who've experienced exactly what I've experienced exactly. And I can find that person. And then concept one talks about the ultimate responsibility and authority. So if I put myself in concept one and I say, I'll read it to you because you know, I love a book. Here's another book. The ultimate responsibility and authority for al World Services belongs to the al groups, but I read it about me. The ultimate responsibility and authority for Sally Ann belongs to Sally Ann. So in that concept, if I put it in my life, I have the ability to respond. I can decide how I'm going to respond. So when I'm in in an emergency, if I go 111, I can call God immediately and I can take action because it's all very well to have this, this, I jokingly say, sky daddy, magical sky daddy who we pray to, to help us. But what can I do in that moment? What action do I need to take? I need to admit, I need to unite, and I need to respond. And I've got one, one, one across those three legacies that's going to keep me busy and it's going to keep me connected to something greater than me because you guys are greater than me. That's what I found when I came in. You know, God isn't this miraculous sky daddy that I'm separate from. When I finished working the steps, I had a spiritual awakening as a result. I found a little bit of God in me. And if that's true, if there's a little bit of God in me, then there's a little bit of God in every single one of these Hollywood squares. And when I connect with you, when I reach out for help and I contact you, I'm contacting a little bit of God. And when the little bit of God in me meets the little bit of God in you, magic happens. The magic is me accepting God's in control. Not me. Not me. Those three legacies save my life every day. I'm so grateful. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for shining a light on the God in you and showing me the the divinity, the divine light, the beautiful person that you are. Because every single time that you do that, when you work the steps, when you study the traditions and practice the concepts of service in your life, I see your light come on and you inspire me. And I'm just going to finish on concept nine because it's one of my favorites. What is good personal leadership? What is good? Well, good is the enemy of the great. So what is great? Well, in service, good can look like a good example or it can look like a great lesson. So sometimes in service, I'm a great lesson of what not to do or I'm a good example of, of what to do in service. But I've decided that the good and good personal leadership stands for God's observation of divinity. And when I see you, behave well in a business meeting and when I see you talk in esteemable ways and take esteemable actions we call them in New Zealand mana enhancing when I see you enhance the mana of each other and I get to be a witness to you doing something today that I know would have baffled you in the past that's God and and the God in me I get that observation of divinity in you so I hope something I've said today has been helpful and I love you all and that's the end thank you thanks for listening I hope you enjoyed the podcast Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way so if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month Visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.